Good evening and welcome to Match of the Day. And if I have to be honest, tonight's programme contains rather less goals than last week's, but I think you'll find more than enough good action to keep you riveted to the set, uh, action provided by Spurs and Aston Villa, Leicester and Watford, and West Bromwich Albion against Norwich. And that's embellished with some fascinating stories from today's Cup Ties, an unusual St Valentine's Day story in which Bo Derrick gives one of today's players 10 out of 10. And the other men of the moment, Mickey Droy, captain of Chelsea, who sensationally eliminated Liverpool, and Graham Turner, manager of Shrewsbury Town, conquerors of Ipswich Town, tell us about their staggering performances too. And the facts behind those sensations, Chelsea beat Liverpool 2-0 with goals by Peter Rhodes-Brown and Colin Lee, while Shrewsbury knocked out the other cup favourites, Ipswich 2-1, the scorers Steve Cross and Jake King. There's also news tonight that World Cup holders Argentina could be without nine star players for the finals in Spain. Well, so we go to White Hart Lane for the second week running. Last week we saw Spurs overwhelm Wolverhampton Wanderers in the league and the fifth round draw of the FA Cup brought together Spurs, the cup holders, and another illustrious team from the Midlands, Aston Villa, the league champions. It was bound to be close and so it turned out. Your commentator, John Watson. It's proving quite a week at White Hart Lane. And as Spurs continue their assault on four trophies, it's time to take stock of the influence of Ray Clements, who has been ever-present since making his debut against Aston Villa in the Charity Shield, and who's kept a clean sheet in all Spurs' nine domestic cup ties this season. That's 810 minutes of cup football without conceding a single goal. But Spurs are forced to make one change. At number five, Graham Roberts comes in because Mick Hazard has now joined Ricky Villar on the injured list and Roberts will play in midfield. Steve Archibald is again named as substitute. Aston Villa are under the caretaker control of Tony Barton after the resignation of Ron Saunders. And with Colin Gibson and Gary Shaw still not fully fit, there's just one change. And that's at number 11 where Tony Morley comes back after being dropped, suspended and transfer listed. Aston Villa start the match playing from right to left. They haven't had a home draw in the FA Cup for five years and the odds are against them today in more ways than one after the turmoil at Villa Park in the week. But remember, they are the league champions and they are in the quarter-finals of the European Cup. Second from the left as we look, in the lighter raincoat, Tony Barton, the acting manager of Aston Villa, and to his right, Roy McLaren. This is with. Now Ken McNaught. Number three is Williams. Morgan Perryman. And that test has started way back at Wembley in August, when they had quite a scrap. Perryman there was the offender. Evans is coming in! Well, last season and the season before, he scored any number of goals from set pieces, 17 in all in those two years. But he hasn't been on target so far this season, although he did get free then. Keith Hackett will remember Tottenham well from last season's FA Cup final when he took charge of both games at Wembley. Calvin's begun a run to the left, marked by Swain, who fouled him, quickly taken, and Galvin's on his way again, quick free kick from Hilton, three in the middle, it's Crooks, Falco's unmarked far post, if he can be found, Perryman, and Villa almost caught out for not concentrating when Swain gave away the original free kick. Puddle. Ardiles, Mortimer for the Villa. Morley. Morley made room for the shots. Well, he had his disagreements with the previous manager. One wonders whether Tony Morley can settle down sufficiently now to play his way into the England World Cup squad which is certainly his ambition.
Hughton. Roberts. Oh, that's a case of uh, the bite a bit, rather, there. Roberts, who was guilty of a trip a little earlier, fouled this time by Gordon Cowns. Here's Hughton. Ardiles trying to slide it through again for Hughton! Alfred Hughton scored a goal in the FA Cup fifth round exactly a year ago today against Coventry, and he might well have scored there. So Galvin this time. Goes Roberts with the goalkeeper and fouls him. This is Evans. With calling for the long ball down the centre. Hewton with plenty of time. Back again by Evans. And a foul by Geddes on Hewton. Galvin and here's Crooks. Price. Crooks again. Put up by Des Brenner. Roberts with Evans. Back by RD Lezon by Hoddle. Price now. Hewton. Price to RD Les. Price continued his run superbly there. He found Crooks in the end. And Falco! Mark Falco, the scourge of Aston Villa. Two goals in the Charity Shield, the first goal here today. But what a part Paul Price played in that. He came from way back, survived two tough challenges, stormed on, finally got the ball out to Crooks. The cross was perfect, so was the header. And Falco puts Tottenham ahead after 33 minutes. with Villa coming back quickly here with Bremner and Ardiles back by his own goal line well what a season they're having at White Hart Lane already through to Wembley in the League Cup a goal up here in the FA Cup fifth round and the quarter-finals of Europe still to come what a time to build a new stand Roberts. Oh, and Rimmer seemed to go late. The important thing was that Rimmer made it in the end. Didn't look to have a lot of power from Graham Roberts. But that could be deceptive from here, the angle on the ball. Geddes. And a good break by Aston Villa this, particularly on this side with Tony Morley as Bremner takes on Hewton on the far side. Villa have got five players forward now, but Hewton defending well.
Tony Galvin showing his pace. Finding Crooks. Nicely played there between Mortimer and With. And now Morley. Geddes in space, but surely somebody was offside. And if it wasn't Geddes, it was With further over. but it won't matter because the referee blows for half-time. With Spurs leading by one goal to nil, scored in the 33rd minute by Mark Falco, a fair reflection of their superiority, although Aston Villa have certainly lacked nothing in determination, and so far it's been a good cup tie. Spurs these days and uh, since the war they've played Aston Villa five times in cup competitions before today and Spurs have won them all they're winning this one by the single goal here's Houghton Ardiles Brooks off the heels of Evans here's Galvin the character was a word often used in conjunction with Aston Villa when Ron Saunders was the manager and there's no reason why it should change in a matter of days. With piling in with the defenders and in doing so he concedes another free kick. Hewton. Target got a flick on it. Brooks is coming in. Evans was with him. Galvin. Hilton Nardinez to his right. Hilton again. Falco, Ardiles, well taken out by Jimmy Rimmer. Lovely build-up by Tottenham, it was patient and precise. And when the ball was played back to Ardiles, it was a good effort and a fine save. will come to get back into the first team action. At Nord. Brenner's in there with Hewton. With is coming in as well. This is Swain. Now it's Cowens. The block was by Roberts. And this is Mortimer. Brenner. Again, a good ball into Peter with Morley out left. Tricking his way inside to still Morley, Mortimer now. And wide again for Swain. With coming and so too is Clements. And Clements goes down and Peter with apologising profusely. <laughs> Real old-fashioned collision between goalkeeper and centre forward, but the important thing from Clements' point of view but that he got the ball away with that punch. Williams tracking back with our dealers. Here's Hoddle. Slightly lazy one, that from Hoddle. And Aston Villa. A 
have had something to bite on these last few minutes. Plenty of possession, more than in the first half. There's Morley, Mortimer. Bremner. With Swain. Taking on Galvin. And Tottenham will be pleased to see that go out for a goal kick because those last few minutes were somewhat breathless back there. And Clement's punch, as Peter With closed in, was an important piece of goalkeeping in a tight match. played by David Geddes to Des Bremner. Peter With pulls away in the centre. There are two others there as well. One of them was Geddes, and the tackle was by Roberts. Spurs were about to substitute God Crooks, I think, then. But Graham Roberts has gone down injured, so that could mean a change of decision on the bench. again with Gordon Cowans and they're still in there one of them was Ken McNaughton took a tumble came out to Morley Bottle got the ball away for Tottenham his crooks and that's all rather up and ready by Alan Evans the situation regarding Garth Crooks he took a knock on Wednesday and he's now gone off to be replaced by the man who enjoyed such a fruitful partnership with Crooks last season, and that's Steve Archibald. Very popular with the crowd. He's been out since the 5th of December, and now with 12 minutes to go, he's on as number 12. Here's Hoddle. Nicely done by Hoddle. Can he pull it back? Dear me. Rimmer and Falco having a little tussle with the goalkeeper, tried to clear the ball. It was Hoddle's good work earlier. Here's Bremner. Oh, Hewton took him there. It was the second time hewton has been guilty of that, and that's got to mean a booking, surely. is up there, so is with. This is Morley. McNaught. Cowan's deflection off and Clements did well to get across. It's in tight matches such as these that Ray Clements' presence has made such a big difference at times for Spurs this season. Roberts charging through the midfield and over committing himself giving Evans the chance to break for Aston Villa Maul is on this side now well the linesman said it didn't go it has now and it's a goal kick is it oh the dispute <laughs> He's over whether the ball was out the first time for a throw, and he says no. Evans actually went to about a possible corner, and that's got a no as well. So it would appear that Spurs are fairly safe. Galvin to Falco. Well, I think Alan Evans has been possibly the man of the match, even though it looks as though he might finish on the losing side. He can't wait to get on with it. And what a week it's been for Spurs. Keith Bergenshaw through to Wembley in the League Cup. Through now to the last eight in the FA Cup, of which they're the holders. Falco's goal decisive in this match. And for Ray Clements, the record goes on. 
900 minutes of League Cup and FA Cup football this season without conceding a goal. No wonder the crowd sing at the end of another successful cup tie for the club that can apparently do no wrong in the cup. Spurs, whose supporters celebrate a narrow but deserved victory. Well, on the face of it, another perfectly balanced cup tie coming up between Leicester City and Watford. Knowing the managers involved, I wouldn't expect to see any penalty points deducted for slow play, but as we've seen before, neither team lacks the flair to grace the big occasion, nor does your commentator, Barry Davis, I'm sure. A look around Filbert Street confirms the appeal of the FA Cup. A crowd nearly three times as large as that which watched the league meeting between these sides, admittedly on a cold day back in December. And on the field, two men with a taste of cup success. Indeed, in the case of Pat Rice, he's made a real meal of it with five Wembley appearances. And back in 1971, he had in the same team Eddie Kelly, who was credited with the first Arsenal goal in what was their double year. And Kelly passed a fitness test this morning, so the Leicester City side is unchanged, including at number three, Paul Fryer, who began his run when Leicester beat Southampton in the third round of the FA Cup. Watford also unchanged. They've already disposed of Manchester United and West Ham, and in the league, drew here when Ross Jenkins scored the equaliser. George Tyson of Sunderland is the referee. And on paper, this is the second division of the FA Cup. But the winner here, entitled to fancy the chances of representing that division at Wembley come the end of May. There's Mark Wellington, the Leicester skipper. On by Young, Terry didn't follow him. Young once more, and here's Andy Peake. Kept it down well, and so did the keeper. And Young coming away, almost to the centre circle, starting that, and Peake finding space on the right. Hit it well, and Sherwood got down well. Barnes. Peake. That's a better touch. Three in the middle. Williams! And it clipped the foot of the post. Lionex who crossed. Williams who finished. But it was the pace of the pass from Andy Freak which changed the pattern of all of that. And the move was set up from that point. Had a quarter of an hour. And I suppose the two best goal efforts have been at the uh, end protected by Steve Sherwood. As you can see, it's absolutely teeming down. Peak. Good dummy turn, but he's got a lot still to do. Pace of Blissett and of Fryer. And Blissett has found it. And Barnes, it just, I think, got a, a flick off Tommy Williams. It took all the pace out of it, but some lovely play by Blissett. from Peak. That's why. Lineker. And the throw being missed as it came in. Suddenly created a space. Lineker wide. And the first half of considerable endeavour ends with a blank score sheet. Smile from Graham Taylor as he takes his place now on the bench.
Steve Terry had a very good first 45 minutes, certainly ahead of Alan Young on points. There's Taylor. Tommy Williams. Lennox. Kelly. Certainly a lot of the ball in the air in the first period. Young, Terry at his back. Peak, Linex. And Brostrom. This is how he's found himself a new role at uh, left back. And lost his place as a midfield player. He's now coming at left back and doing well. Young, Wilson, lovely touch from Young, and here's Lennox, and a corner. And it was Will Brostrom who got across and got the deflection to turn the ball over. After the little touch from Alan Young had opened a gaping hole in the centre of the Watford defence, which Wilson threatened, and then Lennox steaming in from the right was denied by the deflection from Rostrum to take the corner Larry May at the back out by Armstrong from Lineker Andy Peak. Peak once more corner the roar of both hope and approval from the Leicester followers coming away from the line and now going back in O'Neill and John O'Neill the man who wandered away has given Leicester City the lead in the 49th minute they hesitated on the line then the Watford defenders and O'Neill took advantage of that to curl one over the top of a goalkeeper and two other defenders so a totally different complexion now and here's Alan Young Terry rather wild Wilson corner Leicester City have found some inspiration at the start of the second half. A match which certainly needed that quality. It was hard and combative, but not too much more. Here's Kelly. Just one to produce a new. Taylor, Watford's manager, got to make use of another talented teenager, Jerry Armstrong, being replaced by Nigel Callaghan. This is now playing up alongside Ross Jenkins. Barnes to his left. And one by Rostron. Here's Jenkins. but not successfully. Dalton. Kelly. Wilson. Shooting chance was on. And might still be.
free kick given against Lohman. Referee didn't like that challenge. So one has the feeling, looking at Mr Tyson, that when players look at him, daggers drawn, his look is such as to turn them round in the opposite direction. Left post and area covered. Wilson going to have the crack. It's a good one too. Warner is on the right. Hit very cleanly by Wilson. And the goalkeeper all in line just to tip it over. come away again Jenkins and the first touch for Callahan Barnes and Rice lost it and it's curl one by Young line X they've got players over here this is Wilson good challenge again by Rostrum really timed it to perfection and he had to Offside against Wilson. <laughs> Jenkins. Barnes! On the roof. He got round the back, did uh, John Barnes. But he was running out of room and couldn't get the header down enough. And again, Terry really nowhere near the ball. The flag is up for offside against Lineker. O'Neill's first of the season. Jenkins struggling with May, seemingly holding him up. Bless it! Corner given. And the referee talking to Mark Wallington, who certainly was complaining. I must say, if he'd have given a, a verdict there other than the corner, I think the free kick would have gone against Watford. I thought that Wallington was fouled then. match gone and it certainly got better in this half and Terry's come away to meet it now if he could get there but it was well out by O'Neill Taylor and here's Callahan and the youngster both hurt and disappointed but the speed at which Wallington came to him was certainly greatly responsible in the fact that the shot just curled over the crossbar. Mark Wallington, the only survivor on the last occasion that uh, Leicester City were in this round of the cup back in 1976. Young. Sherwood to meet. But by pulling away from his marker, Young is finding much more space and using the ball much more effectively. Rostron having to cover again, but here's Lineker. Good save. Just got a finger to it as Lineker moved off to the right. And also on that occasion, very nearly set up the attacker.
Tour coming up. Out by Williams, but not terribly well. Bolton! <laughs> Kept it down, hit it very hard. Wallington all in line. two offer players offside and the substitution being made Jim Merrow is coming on to replace number seven Steve Lennox so each side has played its last card Leicester lead by the only goal so far. But a second half, so much a better contest. Eddie Kelly taking some covering positions. Callahan. And again, Rushton, the last man. Here's Young, Terry with him, two attackers, three defenders in the box. And another corner. Once more. Not got a bit slow to react. Here's Wilson. Terry. Two chances to get it away. Peak. Melrose. Young coming behind Terry. And here's Melrose. Touched onto the post by Sherwood. Melrose bemoans his luck, but sure we've got down well to turn it onto the post. But Watford unbelievably hesitant in defence. Two clear chances to get the ball away and didn't, and almost played the penalty. Cuff hopes hanging by a thread at the moment. Young and Lineker over the angle. Had a very different second half, Alan Young. Much more productive by using his head more. <laughs> Kelly. Lineker. Melrose in the middle. Two others coming in. One of them was Young, who completely missed his kick. Williams at the back. And Young who turned it in, or did it go off Terry? Tommy Williams coming round the back. He gets all the congratulations. Young poked at it. Terry was in attendance, and in it went. And Leicester City celebrate a place among the FA Cups last eight. That's Callahan. Jenkins, Taylor. Chase for Lohman. And again, the noisier part of the ground chant, Wembley, Wembley, where Leicester City have been four times on every occasion, returned as the vanquished. Terry again. 
man has come away. Challenged. Just a punch, and over the top. Evans. And the Royal greets Leicester City's place in the sixth round of the FA Cup. It's an old cliche, but it's true. Watford can now go and concentrate on the league and cementing their place in the second division battle for promotion. Leicester City celebrate Alan Young, a totally different player in the second half, as indeed was the match. The whole complexion of the match changed when O'Neill scored the first goal in the 49th minute, and they got a second through the unlucky Steve Terry, the ball going off his leg and past Sherwood in the 79th minute. So the final score, Leicester City 2, Watford 0. Well, Watford had their noses in front of Leicester in the promotion race, and Leicester, by beating them today, and as Barry Davis pointed out, helped them be single-minded about reaching the first division. But the other outcome is that there could be only two matches between second division Leicester City and Wembley. A happy prospect for manager Jock Wallace. Well, I'm not too good at smiling, but uh, I'm smiling tonight because I was proud of my lads today. They did a great job. Uh, a great professional job because they kept their concentration and their attitude was right all the way through, so I'm quite delighted for them. Was it the sort of game you expected? Yeah, we knew, we knew that uh, uh, what's the name? Watford had done a great, great job against Southampton last year and we'd done one this year and it was that kind of a battle of the Giants type of thing. We, they, we play a lot of ground football, they play their up and under kind of stuff uh, and it's very effective for them and we have to combat them because they've got big lads. Uh, but at the end of the day, I thought we just shared it on chances, and I, I can't tell you how uh, pleased I am for these lads, because they've, they've worked hard, and I'm, I'm a hard taskmaster, I would think, because I'm moaning, and groaning, and very little praise, but they keep battling on, don't they? The goal early in the second half gave you a chance to show what you could do, didn't it? Well, it settled them a wee bit. It settled, it settled, it settled uh, I felt it settled Young in particular to get this, this, his, ball, his ball back to the midfield man and, and get the through ball after that. And, it takes a lot of... You can't combat it if you've got pace men going into space after the ball and a good passing. And I thought Kelly did a great job during the second half as well, as Wilson and Pete did a hard-running job. But I was just saying that uh, in the dress room that I felt I couldn't pick a man in the match for my team because everybody at one time done a great job, done their job to perfection, and uh, it had been hard to pick for me to pick a man in the match today. Now, some people talk about cup uh, and other people talk about league. I have a feeling that you think that cup and league can go very much together for you, even now. I just play one game at a time. and I don't care if it's a cup, a league, a friendly, five a side, two a side, one a side, as long as that, my team as wins, that's, all, that's lots all I worry about. And we, we, we have now got to establish ourselves in the league with a, with a vengeance if we want promotion. And I think, I think it's on. You think it's running right yeah, at the moment? I think it's on, because they, they're psyched up and they're, they just don't know when to give in. Because I think they're more frightened of me when they come in that dress room than they are the team in the park. There's only 11 of them out there. I <laughs> don't blame them either. Well, after this final match coming up, we'll have all the news from Bob and we'll be hearing from Graham Turner, manager of Shrewsbury, Mickey Droy, captain of Chelsea, and reveal who is Bo Derrick's 10 out of 10 cup tie player. But meantime, it's action again, and what I thought was the most interesting cup tie of our three this evening, the one between West Bromwich Albion and Norwich City. Your commentator at the Hawthorns was Alan Parry. Two strikers who were teammates just a couple of months ago are on opposite sides today and each has a special reason for wanting to score the match-winning goal. Albion Cyril Regis is determined to end a spell of seven games without scoring to press his claims for a place in the England team against Northern Ireland due to be announced soon. And Norwich's John Dean, who played alongside Regis earlier this season, is keen to prove that Albion were wrong to let him go. One of these two could well hold the key to this tie. The teams, while well, Albion make four changes, one positional from their midweek defeat at Tottenham. 16 years old Mickey Lewis replaces the injured Martin Joe. Andy King takes over from Kevin Summerfield, who substitute, and Nicky Cross will play in midfield. Norwich have lost Dave Bennett through injury, and he's replaced by Peter Mendham. And their leading scorer, Ross Jack, has to be content today with the number 12 shirt. So it's West Bromwich Albion in the stripes who get us underway. They're attacking from left to right. And uh, 
a match that could hardly be more vital for both these sides. They're midway down the table in their respective league tables. And the ball twice out of play in these early stages. Quite a contrast in the uh, state of sunshine covering this pitch. One half completely illuminated, the other in shadow. Today's referee is Mr. Joe Worrell of Warrington in Cheshire. A good early break here by Albion, cut out well by Walford for Norwich. Dean prevented the ball crossing the line, but could only concede the throw further up. Stay them to take it for West Brom. Is turning well and finding Regis. Great roars from the Norwich fans for that uh, incisive piece of play by Peter Mendham. And Norwich capitalising on that mistake. Here's Barham. Trip, but the referee allows him to go on. Maguire in hard. And some very strong early challenges as the ball is laid forward for Regis. Norwich very stretched to the back here. King. Good save. Well, Norwich really were stretched at the back then. As the ball was laid into the middle by Regis, the shot came in, it was on target. And the goalkeeper made a good save. Here's Walford. Mend them a beautiful ball infield to Dean. And he finds Birchin. Promising attack. And Dean got back on the end of it too with that shot which went swinging wide. It all began really with that excellent ball from Mendham in midfield. Three Norwich City players involved. When the ball was crossed back into the middle to Dean, his shot went wide. getting players back well when Albion attack them but this is the way to beat it a defender like Robertson coming through and laying it on for Regis and what a fine tackle by Downs the ideal way to beat a packed defence which Norwich were presenting then Robertson coming all the way from the back laying it on for Regis Downs tackle was a saviour and here's Owen the corner quickly taken up in towards Robertson back into the danger zone and O'Neill got it clear Norwich under pressure themselves for a moment. Stay them. And Greg Downs really then made a tackle that saved Norwich a goal. Read the flick on Andy. Andy. Jerry Summers imploring the Albion players to do better. Here's Cross. Layoff by King and Cross with that very good effort from all of 25 yards. Took the one two and delivered that shot, rising all the time, but from that range, it was a good effort. Statham coming to meet the goal kick. Walford's header. Here's Robertson. Regis taking it well on the chest and a lovely piece of control by Regis. Oh, and what a great shot! Oh, one of the goals of the season! Cyril Regis! What a way to end a barren spell! Cyril Regis, who's gone seven games without a goal, scores an absolute beauty. He took the ball on his chest, turned beautifully, went forward, and the shot was absolutely devastating. 24 minutes gone, Cyril Regis gets his first goal since Boxing Day, and it was worth the wait. West Bromwich Albion 1, Norwich City 0, and they'll talk about that one for quite some time. And Ron Greenwood is given food for thought, I'm sure, as he considers his squad for the match against Northern Ireland, and with the injury too to Paul Mariner, Regis couldn't have picked a better moment to score a goal like that. An absolute beauty. So, Norwich have to try and pick themselves up from that. And here's O'Neill 
It runs loose to Dean. He's got to go some to equal that now. Offside. Well, we were saying before the kickoff that uh, Regis could be the man to decide this tie. And with a goal like that, if it is the only goal, if it is the winner, it was a goal absolutely worthy of winning any match. Martin Bennett won it then. While Regis, a new lease of life from that goal, came off Watson and he did well to get it clear. Here's Lewis, Statham, Bennett on the far side in space, Owen trying to get on the end of that one too, and Walford's having a good game though for Norwich, who could stretch Albion with this counter-attack. O'Neill feeding it to Barham, Birchin and Dean in the middle, and it comes to Mendham, and the header was brilliantly saved by Groove. Albion still not clear of danger. But Regis won it back well. Mackenzie playing it to King. Owen is free on the left. Regis will chase and is onside. Norwich all at sea at the moment. Two in the middle for him. Oh, what a good saving header again by Walford. So in the space of a few seconds, near misses at both ends. Mendham with the diving header well saved. And then that clearance by Walford and Albion themselves were stretching Norwich. Barham on the right. Simmons overlapping for him. And he comes inside. The shot deflected. Stay them in a bit of trouble here. And he's really run into an impossible situation that stay them and was lucky to survive it. Battling well. The referee right on hand to uh, intervene then and award the free kick. Or is he going to? Yes, he's decided on a bounce up. Well, it bounced very fortunately then for Regis. And here's Owen. Well, he ran completely into trouble. O'Neill. Still O'Neill, and still, what a good run, Barham. Dean. Oh, oh well, that was remarkable. Drew can't believe it. Neither can Dean. And Mendham, who got the touch on, saw the ball deflect off the goalkeeper, and then it somehow or other came back and ended up in Mark Drew's arms. But O'Neill is the man who takes credit for a marvellous run down the right to set up that uh, attack, which indeed is the final attack of the first half. So Grew a little bit fortunate in the end that uh, he's able to keep a clean sheet. But this man, Cyril Regis, will be the player they're talking about around the Hawthorns at half-time. A quite stunning goal, and one which brings a smile to his face and a scoreline of West Bromwich Albion 1, Norwich City 0. Well, the vagaries of a British winter perfectly seen at the Hawthorns. We started with half the field covered in bright sunshine. Now, at the start of the second half, there are hailstones falling, would you believe? So the referee checks with the linesman, and it'll be John Dean to get this second half underway, having been uh, massively overshadowed by his opposite number nine, Cyril Regis, in that first half. And while one of the reasons for that, he marked him well, Aimed at Barham. And a good ball turned forward too. Robertson uh, looked as though he'd misread it then and still could be in trouble, but Owen's got him out of it. And here's Statham. Tried to play it over the back of the defence. Watson was quick. Regis uh, almost just as quick. These sides, incidentally, have only met uh, surprisingly once before in the FA Cup in season 68 69, when Albion won here by three goals to nil. 
a little bit scruffy and scrappy in midfield at the moment. Finally, it's O'Neill who brings it away. This is Barham. Mendham. Finding Birch in. Good control. And Barham again. Difficult one that for Robertson. Birch in winning it once more. Here's O'Neill. Good skill. And a corner. John Wilde coming across to cover. O'Neill doing well then with that little flick up in the air. And Wilde happy to see the ball go behind. was only just over the crossbar and uh, no wonder then that Steve Walford and Dave Watson posed so many problems as the ball was played high in the air the Albion defenders watching those two and Birching came in and headed it just over the bar and forward by Lewis Barham. Simmons again. Given away. Here's Owen with Regis. Oh, good skill. Regis. A good layoff to to McKenzie. Fine save. Well, that uh, reminded one of that stunning goal he scored in the Wembley Cup final last year. The kind of shot, certainly, that produced a goal on that time. But uh, Woods right behind it this time. Norwich just can't get things flowing in midfield at the moment. Greg Downs has been one of their main points of attack, and that's a good ball from him to Maguire. Here's O'Neill. Dangerous looking ball into the middle, well cleared by Wilde. Maguire piling the pressure on again, though. Virgin's cross. Mendham unmarked, and here's Dean, and it comes loose to Barham, and still Dean, and Mendham again, and in the end, Mackenzie gets it clear. Well, that was uh, an anxious moment indeed for Albion, with Norwich getting three snaps at that loose ball, and in the end, Mackenzie was the man who got across to clear. And uh, Mark Barham, the man very much at the heart of that piece of action, took a rather painful knock. Ross Jack, the substitute, who in fact is Norwich's top scorer and who scored the third round winner at Stoke. Looks as though he's about to come on. So, a sad sight then, young Mark Barham, just 18 years of age. That goal mouth collision has brought the end of the game prematurely for him and Norwich have brought on their substitute, Ross Jack. And here's Lewis. Given away, it's all a bit scrappy in midfield, but Lewis battling away well. Bennett. Good layoff that by Cross. Turned in first time by Bennett to King. Back again to Cross! A very good effort. Certainly the best of this second half. The ball played in from the right, King turned it back, Cross with the first time shot from just outside the area, over the top. Walford now. Good ball to Simmons, midway through this second half. Norwich still a goal to nil down. Walford again. They've certainly got enough man forward here, Norwich. One of them is Downs. Look for Dean across the area, Ross Jack. So the cross came in from the left, up went Dean and nodded it down, and Jack was so close to what would have been a sensational goal. This is Downs. 
cross intercepting. The linesman has flagged, but the referee has said play on. Now he's whistled. I don't think he saw the linesman at first. Mr. Worrell allowed Owen to go on for what looked like a one against one situation with the goalkeeper, but then suddenly cut him short with the whistle. Free kick given. Downs kick. Here's Dean. Mackenzie forward, cross chasing. Is he quicker than Watson? Well, he's got there first anyway. Mackenzie back on the end of it. Good save. Well, Cross and Mackenzie combining well then, and the ball was laid into the path of Mackenzie. He hit it hard, but Woods parried it away. Robertson happy to lift that high into the crowd, which incidentally is just a little short of 19,000 today. Crowd imploring the referee to blow the final whistle. They know it's been a real battle in this second half for Albion to hold on as Birchin crosses dangerously again. This is Jack. Mackenzie hoofs it clear. And look at this, this is incredible. Two Albion players and only Chris Woods. Regis, can he go all the way and finish this? No, he can't. Woods, considering the situation, did magnificently. An incredible counter-attack, Cross and Regis all alone, Woods stood between them and what would have been a clinching goal, Regis took it too close to the keeper, fine save. But that's the final whistle and Norwich's brave battle, and they did battle well in the second half, ends in defeat. Not a game of the greatest quality perhaps, a typical cup tie in many ways, few chances, and one that did go in was created by the genius of Cyril Regis. A magnificent goal, and it was enough to clinch a victory for West Bromwich Albion and a place in the quarter-finals. The final score, West Bromwich Albion 1, Norwich City 0. Well, I don't begrudge West Bromwich Albion that victory, nor Cyril Regis his relief at scoring such a splendid goal that deserved to win a cup tie. But I did feel sorry for Norwich City, who took the game to Albion and in no way looked inferior, either territorially or for pure ability. And Ken Brown looks to have welded together a team that could regain former glories quite quickly. Well, Albion are one of only three First Division clubs who go into Monday's quarter-final draw. The other two are holders Spurs and Coventry City. The five other quarter-finalists will all come from the second division. One of them, Chelsea, provided the most memorable result, beating Liverpool 2-0 in front of a 41,000 crowd at Stamford Bridge with goals from Peter Rhodes-Brown and Colin Lee. So let's now find out exactly how Chelsea knocked out the European champions as we join their captain, Mickey Droy. I think we've done ever so well. We got the result we wanted. Um, I should think they probably feel a bit disappointed, but you know, it's about the third time we've done them now and uh, we're well pleased, obviously. You've got the Indian sign on Liverpool, haven't you? Um, I, I think <laughs> they won't be too, you know, sort of pleased to get, you know, be, uh, to be drawn against us again in, in cup games because we just seem to have something over them, and uh, you know, we've done them a few times now. Liverpool might feel it was a freak result, but of course Chelsea would argue that it was the result of good planning. Um, yeah, obviously Liverpool had a hell of a lot of the play, but you know, we, we we knew that they was going to uh, come forward a lot, and we had to contain them. And as long as we didn't give away anything silly, then we had a good chance of uh, scoring goals in a break. And uh, that's really what happened. And the, the Chelsea management, I know, watched Liverpool's last three games and mm. felt that Sue Ness in particular was allowed too much freedom in the middle of the park by teams like Ipswich. Yeah. Um, I think what's happened in the games that our, our manager and the assistant manager have watched is they're played against first division opposition and uh, the teams have allowed them too much time and space. And obviously if you do that against teams like Liverpool, they just slaughter you. So what we tried to do was to put uh, Colin Pates on uh, Graham Sunes and close him down to stop him playing and uh, to counteract the threat of Terry McDermott and that's what we did. It didn't work too well in the first half in the case of McDermott but uh, overall now we contained them, we kept them to shots from outside the box and on the break we fancied our chances and uh, we scored two goals for it. Deserved it? Um, yeah I think so, why not? You know, we, we were the underdogs, we had nothing to lose, we knew it was going to be a hard battle and we scored two goals, they didn't score any. And our reporter, Tony Gubber. So a great performance by Chelsea, but one match by another second division club, Shrewsbury, who are managed by Graham Turner. They beat UEFA Cup holders Ipswich 2-1.
Graham, a well-deserved win with set pieces the key. Well, yes, I remember you coming down three or four years ago to watch the, the, the cup run when we played uh, Cambridge and then Manchester City and we were scoring off corners in those days and we're still doing it now. Um, very difficult to defend against. We scored from a corner and, and a free kick. I know you played yourself this morning, Graham, for the third team. Is there a chance perhaps you could be back for the sixth round or, or even Wembley? <laughs> well, I mean, it, Wem Wembley's a dream. It's a dream we've had since we played in the, in the third round. Um, it's getting closer. I don't think there's any reason to change that, but I've, I've been out for a long time this season and obviously I'm, I'm trying to get much fit again. Um, there's always a chance, but the way the lads played today, there's... Uh, you know, uh, they'll continue to play because they did such a fine job. So Shrewsbury, one of nine teams who go into Monday's draw and also one of the six who've never won the cup. The others, Coventry, Leicester, Queen's Park Rangers and Crystal Palace or Orient, two teams who replay on Tuesday, kick off 8 o'clock, after the only draw of the round, 0-0. The other seven ties were all won by the home side and that's a fifth round record. Coventry knocked out the last third division club Oxford with Gary Thompson and Mark Haisley getting two goals apiece in an impressive 4-0 victory, which I can tell you did little to help Jimmy Hill's bad shoulder as it had him leaping around the room. <laughs> There's one cup tie we haven't mentioned tonight, Queen's Park Rangers 3-1 victory over Grimsby. Simon Stainrod set Rangers on their way with his 18th goal of the season. In the league, Kevin Keegan scored his 21st goal of the season to help first division leader Southampton to a 2-0 win over Nottingham Forest. But with Manchester United winning 1-0 at Wolves with a goal by Gary Birtles, Southampton's lead at the top remains two points. Manchester City go third after beating Brighton 4-0 and Arsenal moved up from seventh to fourth following their late 1-0 victory over Notts County. In Division 4, one result this evening, Torquay 0, Wigan 0 and that means Wigan stay in second place behind Sheffield United on goal difference. United went top this afternoon after beating York 4-0. Pools, and although there were 10 score draws on the coupons, dividends will be fairly good. Claim by Telegram for 24 points. The numbers 12, 13, 15, 27, 35, 39, 47, 48, 49 and 53. Finally, a possible World Cup disaster for Argentina. Today, nine of their squad, including captain Daniel Passarella and striker Mario Kempes, were suspended by their club, River Plate, over a pay dispute. The suspension could be for a year, and if the Argentinian FA follows suit, the nine players could all miss the finals in Spain. What's the betting that doesn't happen? Hmm. Well, nine teams go into the hat on Monday, and astonishingly, only three of them from the first division. The least number in 51 years. And it seems that anything can happen in this season's FA Cup competition. For instance, a striker could wake up in the morning dreaming of a goal and a Valentine card from Bo Derrick. Not a bad way to wake up either, I'd say. But Cyril Regis, West Brom striker, announced in the paper this morning that he would rather score a goal than have a Valentine card from Bo Derrick. Well, Cyril got his goal, but with a little bit of ingenuity on our part, and a bit of cooperation and charm from the lady concerned, we managed to make both dreams come true. Good night to you. Cyril, this is Bo Derrick from California. Jimmy tells me that your game today deserves the Big Ten, and your goal especially. So it's my pleasure as a fan of all sports to send you this special Valentine. A big hug and a kiss from me. Regis taking it well on the chest and a lovely piece of control by Regis. Oh, and what a great shot! Oh!